I'm going to train you and teach you a social skill, if nothing else, how to shake a hand and share your name and welcome a stranger. Thank you, Jerry. You, therefore, my son, you, therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, these entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. I hope you see there, especially judges and professors, you see those four generations of, of education. And all of you involved in this congregation understand that. Those things, Timothy, which you have heard from me, I want you to teach other people who will be able to teach others also. Does anybody see that? The things that you have learned are not just your precious treasures that you hide away in a chest somewhere and you keep for your own aggrandizement. Those things, Timothy, which you have heard from me, I want you to teach other men who will be able to teach others also. Does anybody see that in the text? Share the good news. Teach it. Train it. Adopt somebody as your son and let them move forward. When I was 13 years old, I wanted to be an athlete in the worst way and succeeded. I was an athlete in the worst way. <laughs> my older brother was much larger than, than I am. Stand up right there. Yes. <laughs> you have my... Is your name Tom Kane? I mean, a lot of, okay, sit down, sit down. And you have the shape of my older brother. By the way, I, I told you my name was Kane. My name is Jerry. My older brother is named Tom. Yeah, that's right. What kind of family would name their first two children Tom and Jerry? So when I am this little skinny kid trying to be an athlete, and my big brother is pounding on me one day, you know, and he said, if you're ever going to be an athlete, you're going to have to figure out who you want to be like, and you're going to have to hang a picture on the wall, and you're going to have to look like that. You're going to have to get an image and a model in mind. And old man Paul, old man Paul writes to young man Timothy, and he says, Timothy, I want you to hang three pictures on your wall. And every morning when you get up and you try to find your whisker, <laughs> Timothy, I want you to uh, see those three pictures hanging on the wall. Whether you are 13 years old or 16 years old or 60 years old, there's three images that mark our maturity. Picture number one looks something like this. Out of my translation, suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier in active service entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life so that he may please the one who enlisted him as a soldier. Picture number one, Timothy, that I want you to hang on your bathroom mirror is that of a soldier. In this beautiful King James language, it talks about no man that warreth entangle himself in the affairs of this life that he may please the one who hath chosen him to be a soldier. This last Friday we celebrated our soldiers and we thanked our soldiers and we appreciated those soldiers who have given up time, given up a major section of their life, given up the creature comforts that we enjoy every day so that we might enjoy a fuller picture of life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness. And let me add two days late my thanks and my appreciation to each one of you who have served as a soldier. Now, as he writes about the soldiers, he's writing about a scene in which battle was always engaged in a valley. All right? The valley is here. Over here is a hillside. A commanding officer is on that hillside. Down here is the valley. Over here is a hillside, and the commanding officer is on that hillside. Now, the commanding officer can look down in the valley where the soldiers are, and from his perspective would give directions and instructions via a bugler about whether the right flank should attack or the left flank should retreat or, 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 or that kind of thing, all right? 
and the soldiers down here in the valley are always listening for the bugle sound that's coming from the commanding officer up on the hillside. The commanding officer has a different perspective than the guy down in the valley. Down in the valley is where the bushes are. Down in the valley is where the ditches are. Down in the valley you can't see very far because that's where all the groys and all the gullies are. Are you with me? And so the guy down here in the valley has to trust, has to trust the sound that he hears from the commanding officer. And the first question today, right next to that picture is, uh, first word for today is trust. How much do you trust the commanding officer? And the first question for today in marking our spiritual maturity is how much are we willing to trust God? All right? As a soldier does not necessarily understand that commanding officer, but he trusts that commanding officer. And whenever he hears that sound for him to attack, he, he does not lay down his sword and his shield and, and walk up the hillside and say, now, would you please explain to me why I have to attack? <laughs> he trusts that commanding officer. He knows that commanding officer has his good at heart. And if that commanding officer bugles for him to attack, he attacks with gusto and with vigor and with energy because this soldier has learned to trust his commanding officer. The mark of our maturity is how much do we trust God? Does anybody understand that? And it begins... It begins on that intentional day when we say, God, I trust you with my sins. Can you talk about that? Moms and dads and grandmas and grandpas, do you ever talk about that to your kids and your grandkids? I know that fish you caught is a wonderful story, and you ought to get to tell that over Thanksgiving and Christmas one more time. But... Can you talk about when you intentionally gave your life to Jesus Christ, which is a better story than the fishing story? And your kids and grandkids near to hear that more than they need to hear the fishing story. And I still remember it. I'm sitting right there where you are, second row. My parents... I didn't have to sit with my parents, but I had to sit in front of my parents. <laughs> Did you ever have parents like that? There were no teenagers on the back row, you know. We had to sit in front of our parents. And my parents sat on the third row, and so I was doomed. I either had to sit on the second row or the first row, and as a Baptist, I'm never going to sit on the front row. So I, you know, I had one option. And I remember when I was eight years old, sitting right there where you, I intentionally gave my life to Jesus Christ. It is as real to me. I cannot tell you what I got for Christmas when I was eight years old, but I can tell you I trusted my sins into the hands of God. Have, what have you trusted into the hands of God? Have you ever entrusted your sins into the hands of God? You say, God, take care of them. I cannot deal with them. I now trust those. How much do you trust God? And young people, I need to ask you today, I need to ask you today, young people, how much do you trust God? Do you trust God with your future? Oh. Now he's going to want us to all come down there and sign some card that we're going to go off to Nigeria and be missionaries and teach little kids, Jesus loves me, this I know. Yeah, he might. If you trust him with your future, teenagers, do you hear me? If you trust him with your future, he may send you to Nigeria to teach little children Jesus loves me. And he may do something even worse with you. He may send you to Huntley to teach algebra. <laughs> you understand? You don't ask, okay, God, show me the plan for my life, and then I will choose whether I want to accept that plan or not. No. No. 
you step out right now and say, I trust as that soldier trusts that commanding officer, I am going to trust my future into God's hands. Wherever he sends me, I'm going to go with a smile on my face and a spring in my step because he loves me and he's caring for me. How much do you trust the commanding officer? And grandmas and grandpas and moms and dads. Do you trust your kids into the hands of God? How much do you really trust God? Do you trust your kids into the hands of God? Do you see how many times in the Heils Geschichte, the holy history here, that God's people turn a corner when moms and dads come into the presence of God and dedicate their children into the hands of God? Over and over that happens throughout the Old Testament. And as you get into, into the Advent, you're going to see that happen again next month. I bet you right here in this church, there's a mom and dad that's going to come and dedicate that little baby Jesus into the hands of God. And there's some moms and dads sitting here saying, wait, wait, wait. If I give my hand, children into the hands of God, you know, Send my children to Nigeria to teach little children Jesus love me. And I won't get to see them every weekend. And I only get to see them once every four years when they come home as missionary furlough. Do you understand that? And moms and dads are rather shy, timid about trusting anything into the hands of God beyond their seeing. Do you trust him with your kids? Do you trust him with your finances? Okay, I'll move on. Do you trust him with your health? Do you trust him with your business? Do you trust him with your marriage? Teenagers, do you trust him with your marriage? How much do you trust God? At some point you say, I'm going to quit sweating it, I'm going to quit worrying about it, I'm going to trust it in the hands of God. You bring me the person you prepared for me to make me the best person you intended me to be. Quit pushing it. How much do you trust God? Picture number two is in verse number five. Timothy, hang this picture on your bathroom mirror, and every morning when you go in to shave, I want you to see this picture of an athlete. My translation says, also, if anyone competes as an athlete, he does not win the prize unless he competes according to the rules. If man also strives for masteries, man that strives for mastery, this is King James, man that strives for mastery, beautiful language, striving for mastery, that's the athlete. Man that strives for mastery is not crowned except he strive lawfully. Now he's using the image here, number two, of an athlete. And it's not necessarily the athlete that, that, that works well with a team or the athlete that trains hard. It says here, have you got it? It says something about obedience. It says something about obeying the rules. The athlete does not win the prize except he strive lawfully. So, word number two is obey. And question number two is how willing are you to obey God? The second mark of a spiritually mature person is one who lives a disciplined life of obedience. Now that's hard for us. That is really hard for us. It, 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 was, it was Augustine. It was Augustine who would create this, this, this phrase, um, original sin, original sin, all right? Now, there's some guys at Judson University who think original sin is something that's never been done before, and we're going to do it this weekend. But that is not, that is not the definition of original sin. Ah, oh, there, I see fraternity guys with that blue t uh, purple tie on, you know. Original sin, this ain't never been done before. We're going to do it this weekend. <laughs> um, so... Original sin, it, it, it describes something within us. It describes something within us that makes us want to step across the line. Let me do it this way. The best way I can explain that is, is uh, um, 
You know, in Illinois, they only let us drive 65 miles an hour. The line right there is 65. Yet, how fast do we drive? Are you with me? Now, I was in Missouri this week. And in Missouri, they got a line right there, and the line says 70 miles an hour. Boy, in Missouri, you can drive 70 miles an hour, and if the, if the, if the rule is 70 miles, how fast are we going to drive? <laughs> All right? Now, if you've been out to my part of the world, in New Mexico, you can drive 80 miles an hour. <laughs> yeah. And if the rule is 80 miles an hour, how fast do we drive? That's a silly little illustration. But there's something deep within us that makes us want to step across the line. That's this original sin. There's something deep within us that makes us want to disobey and rebel. How many calories should you eat at lunch today? Okay, I'll, I'll get away from that. All right. You see, we know what we should do. Our, 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 our problem is the will to do what we know we ought to be doing, you know, and... and He said, let me give you a rule. Let me give you a rule. And you strive lawfully to maintain that rule. Let me give you this rule. This rule should be, this rule should be, um, bring honor to your father and your mother. Oh, come on. I have to bring honor to my father and my mother You will live a happier, more fulfilled, and contented life if you will bring honor to your father and your mother. <laughs> Those people restrict me and, <laughs> and make me come in by midnight. There's another rule. Let's, let's say right here, let's say right here, thou shalt not commit adultery. Uh, but, but wait, I am a national name. I am a, thank you. I am a <laughs> superstar. The rules do not apply to me. I get to, does anybody understand that? And this pastor every week sees lives that are ruined and crushed and broken into so many pieces that all king's horses and all the king's men will never put them together again because they chose to step across the rule. And many of you have been heartbroken and your lives have been ruined because somebody stepped across the rule. Or you stepped across the rule. And football coaches have a set of rules and we are going to stay within those rules. Do you hear me, football coaches, wherever you are in Illinois or Pennsylvania? We will not destroy kids' lives. We will not ruin families. We will not mess people up because we are superstars and we get to play outside the rules. You understand that? That licentiousness is a mark of babyhood and infantility, infantilism. Give me a better word. Being a child. <laughs> it is a mark of Martin. It does not have anything to do with maturity or sophistication or being suave. It is a mark of you're still a baby and you cannot play within the rules. You got me? If you are an athlete, you bat with the right amount of pine tar. You run with the right amount of steroids. You play within the rules. In a youth ministry or a young person or a 70-year-old person that's still playing outside the rules is not mature. You're still a kid. You're still a baby. Grow up. Get some discipline. Okay, I'll try to quit. All right. Picture number three is verse number six. Now, have you got the first two down? You got the first two down? 
If John Samus were here, if John Samus were here, he would say, okay, now let's all stand and sing, trust like a soldier and obey like a, yeah. And if you will trust and obey for To be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Okay, I, I want you to know the kids are a better choir than you are. All right, you are pretty lazy this morning. Or maybe I picked a white man's song you don't even know that. Well, okay, that's all I know. Trust and obey. Trust and obey. There's no other one. Okay, so anyway. But John Samus isn't here, and so Paul had a third picture here rather than a rather than stop with just trust and obey. And he has a third thing about the hardworking farmer ought to be the first to receive his share of the crops. And again, a beautiful language, the husbandman that laboreth must be first to be partaker of the fruit. The husbandman, that, that's a farmer, that's a farmer. My father was a groceryman. I thought groceries came from a grocery store. <laughs> I had to go off to college to learn that bananas weren't black. Um, <laughs> has anybody here grown up in a grocery store? You understand? Uh, okay. It's a depraved life, you know. <laughs> Tomatoes are soft. And, and uh, every time we come home for supper, you know, there's a bent can on the table. <laughs> a bent can with no label. That was really, that's really rough in a grocerman's family. Mom would open the, <laughs> open the can. We'd have a prayer. This is what we're going to eat. Alpo's not bad, but it's, uh, <laughs> most bent cans without labels have beets in them. I ate more beets than anybody else in the world. Okay, now, excuse me for chasing that rabbit. I'm sorry. Uh, some confession deep within my, but, 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 but um, food does not come from the grocery store. Food comes from the farmer. You got me? You know, you may be a little bit isolated here because you live in the suburbs and you don't realize that, but food comes from a farmer. And if you go and exegete the text, the, fa the farmer that labors, the farmer that labors first. And so our, 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 our picture is the farmer. You hanging out on your bathroom mirror. You look for your whisker. Okay, that's the farmer. And our word is going to be another four-letter word. Okay, you with me. And so our question is, how willing are you to work for God? I know I'm preaching to the choir this morning. You're here on a Sunday morning. You work for God. Thank you very much. You are much better off being here than you are at the best ball game and the best singles bar in all of Chicago. Are you with me? You're going to find better people here than you will in any of those other environments. I want you to work. I want you to work. Our culture teaches us to get by as little as you can. Get by with being average. Get by with being mediocre. Please do not settle for that stuff that the culture is going to sh going to share with you and 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 teenagers do you hear me this the christian kids in your high school may not be the brightest but they better be the hardest working yes. are you with me i am so glad to hear this report on how you're doing academically in the grades the books you're reading the papers you're writing the way you're thinking ciphering analyzing keep that up but if you don't fit in that category folks you still better be the hardest working person in your class. All right? And it's not the Christian kids that are getting by with bare minimum. It's not the Christian kids that are doing just as little as they can. The hard working, hard working, hard working farmer has a chance to reap a crop. And you get your papers in on time and you sit up front and you play like you got a smile on your face and you like this stuff, all right? And that will carry you so much farther than being sulking on the back row with your arms crossed, pouting about how miserable I am in this chemistry class. Yes. 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 Jesus 
Jesus would say, don't you ever settle for just being mediocre. If they come up and they slap you on the right cheek, the bare minimum is you've got to stand there and take that. But if you are one of my kids, you do more than you have to do. You do more than you have to do, and thus you... Yeah, is this new to you? Yeah. Or he's going to come up and he's going to say, carry my pack a mile. Okay, I hate to do it. I'll carry it one mile. But Jesus said, if you're one of my kids, you do more than you have to do. And you pick that pack up and you, you carry it two miles and you carry it with a grin on your face. Are you with me? And oh, they're going to come this week, and they're going to say, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me, seven times forgive me. Well, if you're one of my kids, you got to do the that's a bare minimum seven times. But if you're one of my people that carry my name, you don't just forgive them seven times, you, seven times seven. you do more than you have to do. You do more than you have to do. Amen. Oh, I'm sorry that sounds so puritanical, but it's true, it's biblical. I'm sorry, I got it out of the Bible. I didn't make this up. <laughs> The hard-working farmer starts from dawn till dusk, not just nine to five. And if you are farming and trying to farm from nine to five, next year at this time you'll be selling insurance. You got me? You will work from can till can't is what a farmer does. Has a chance to reap, no promise, no promise but a chance to reap. Oh, thank you for listening. And Paul would finish by saying, I want you to be a, I want you to be a soldier that trusts God. Do you hear me? Where are you on that? Do you trust him with your sins and anything beyond your sins? I, 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 I want you to be an athlete that plays by the rules. Do you still think you're cute? When you're outside the room. Number three, I want you to be a farmer. I want you to be a farmer and work. You may not be the brightest guy in the shop you work in, but you better be the hardest working if you're carrying the name of Jesus. And you work. We don't settle for bare minimum. And then he finishes with this little promise to Timothy on verse number seven. Timothy... If you'll keep those three pictures in front of you, consider what I say, and the Lord will give you understanding and a whole bunch of other stuff that you don't ever understand. The Lord will give you understanding in everything if you will trust me and obey me and work for me. And you'll grow up. You'll be mature. <laughs> Pastor Love, I'm going to do something different. All right, thank you very much. You've given me such freedom today. I'm honored to fill your pulpit. I'm going to ask us to sing our closing piece. Is our youth choir going to do our final number? How are we going to do it? Band, I want you to come. Whatever we're going to do, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to ask Love to stand here at the front. And if you're ready to mature and grow up in one of three areas, please hear my instruction. Would you come forward and shake his hand and only say one word? <laughs> and your one word is either trust, obey, or work. Would you make one commitment in one of those three areas? Now, Pastor Love, please don't take time to pray with everyone. Please don't write down any names. We're not going to do that because the ball game starts at 3.15. Are you with me? <laughs> My point is I'd like to see a, a group of young people and a group of old people, a group of God's people to say, I want to, I want to mature a little bit more in one area of my life. And you know what you mean. You know what you're talking about. That's between you and God, and that's enough. You don't have to get it beyond that. But there's something you're going to do a little differently. I want to mature somewhere. I'm not going to abuse you. I'm not going to harangue you. I'm not going to manipulate you. 
But would you step forward, greet your pastor, say one word, go back to your place. You keep singing. You've made a commitment between you and God. Let's stand. Let's grow up. Let's mature. Let's trust, obey, and work for the kingdom of God.